Spread across Central Asia and deep into India and China, this network of roads was once the center stage for the spread of ideas, trade, and culture. Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and most importantly, Buddhism fanned out from this region. This is where the mighty empires fell and rose. Many kingdoms appeared from Mesopotamia, the region where the first cities were born in the 6th century BC. The most successful one was the Persian Empire, also known as the Achaemenid Empire, which had spread to the shores of the Aegean, to Egypt, and to the foot of the Himalayas. The Persians embraced foreign customs. This enabled a smooth administration of the foreign lands. The lands became stable. A road network of 2,500 kilometers in length across the shores of Asia Minor, the modern part of Asian Turkey, facilitated the empire to flourish in trade, which in turn provided revenues for military expeditions. They spread. However, there was a problem with the nomadic tribes who lived across the grassland belts in southern Russia, known as the steppes. They were notorious for their ferocity. They were set to drink the blood of the enemies, but they were important partners in the supply of the fine heavenly horses, which could not be ignored. Horses won wars. The Greeks marveled at the East, learning from the Persians' relationships with the nomadic tribes. Then came Alexander of Macedon. He did not look to Europe. He was consumed by the possibilities in the East. A disruptive expedition in 331 BC uprooted Persians' rules over Egypt. Persian armies under Darius III fell. Before long, cities in Asia Minor came under his power. The relentless expeditions with astounding speed of Alexander came to a halt when he died in 323 BC. Seleucus, the new leader, who was one of Alexander's officers, emerged. Seleucids reigned over the land stretching from Indus to the Tigris for nearly three centuries. Greek ideas, literature, language, cultures, and symbols were introduced. The short-lived Jin Dynasty was succeeded by the Han Dynasty, established under the rebel leader Liu Bang in 202 BC. It was the golden age in the Chinese history. The empire expanded further into Xinjiang, beyond the Ganzu Corridor at the edge of Taklamakan Desert. The Yuezi people flanked the western border, and the Xiongnu roamed on the northern steppes. The Xiongnu were the fiercest and the most violent nomadic tribes of that time. Han emperors were willing to pay hefty tributes and bribes instead of risking war with the Xiongnu. And the horses too. Chinese demands for the horses were enormous. The Han had to maintain that thin, delicate relationship with the nomads. The Han continued to build the Great Walls to keep the Xiongnu nomads out. With each treaty with the Zhongnu, the size of the tribute increased and silk units, which was pretty much the currency of that time, soared to staggering proportions. This became too much for the empire to bear. Zhongnu's leader, the Shan Yu, greatly expanded the nomad empire, driving back Yuezi people as far as Xinjiang beyond the Pamirs. This prompted Emperor Wu of Han to form an anti Zhongnu alliance with the Yuezi people. So, he sent a palace official, Zhang Qian, in 138 BC to the west. He was intercepted by the Shan Yu's troops and escaped after 10 years from the Zhang Nu captivity. He wasn't stationary though, he moved with the tribes. 13 years later, he returned to the capital with news and the discoveries of the west. By this time, an all-out Han Zhang Nu war was imminent. Emperor Wu of Han waged war against the Heavenly Horse, rearing Daiyuan Kingdom, now in eastern Uzbekistan, which he believed could help him win the war against the Zhongnu. There were several wars with the Zhongnu for decades. Zhang's discovery served as a distraction to the empire. He was the pioneer of the Silk Roads. Deprived of Chinese grains and supplies, there were defectors in Shan Yu's troops which eventually led to form an alliance with the Han in 105 BC. Emperor Wu of Han got 1,000 horses. That's what's important. Trade between China and the West grew slowly. The roads, however, were treacherous, and the terrains dizzyingly steep. There is the dry, dreaded Taklamakan Desert, with the temperature ranging from negative 20 Celsius to 40 Celsius. The most important among the trades was this trade in silk. Silk was basically the international currency of that time. You could pay your troops in silk. It was also one of the most reliable currency. 
Visitors entering China had now been counted and kept records of. The Laikids were finally overthrown by Arsaci I in Persia in 247 BC. Rome had emerged victorious over many cities and towns around the Mediterranean. Its eyes were too fixed on the east. The backbone of the violence-loving martial Rome was the army. Marriage was frowned upon to keep fit and fierce young men bonded to each other to fight for Rome. Cleopatra, the last active ruler of the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt, which had been ruling Egypt for nearly 300 years, messed up her affair with the Roman general Marcus Antonius. Julius Caesar had been appointed perpetual dictator in 49 BC and was assassinated in 44 BC. Caesar's adopted son, Octavian, won the Battle of Actium in 31 BC over Mark Antony and Cleopatra. The following year, Octavian conquered Ptolemaic Egypt, ending the Hellenistic period that had begun with the conquest of Alexander the Great of Macedon in the 4th century BC. Octavian's power then became unassailable, and in 27 BC, the Roman Senate formally granted him overarching power in the new title Augustus, effectively making him the first Roman emperor. Cleopatra committed suicide over her gross incompetence and negligence. Rome transformed. The harvest from the vast Nile Valley tumbled the prices of food grain, interest rates plummeted, and there was a surge in the property prices. Income increased. Teams of auditors and tax officers spread out all across the empire. Census takers were sent to Judea to conduct census to enumerate taxes correctly. Jesus Christ was one registered with the officials. Romans caught the whiff of decadence and fine living in the East. It was wealthy, the harvest legendary, its produce incredible, and the size of its herd amazing, wrote Cicero. It was in the East where the Roman soldiers learned to make love, to be drunk, and to enjoy art, wrote the poet Sallust. East was opposite to what the Romans stood for. Augustus ordered a survey in 1 BC on the Persian Gulf. He heard about land routes going deep into Central Asia through Persia. By that time, Roman trades with the Indian ports were underway. Wealth brought new taste to the Romans. The appearance of a particular material struck them with wonder. Silk! The increasing popularity of silk among the Roman elite was felt. Seneca complained that clothing made of silk could neither hide the curves nor the decency of the ladies of Rome. As much as 100 million sesterces were spent on importing eastern commodities, which was like 10% of the entire Roman budget. Silk was not the only commodity traded. Glasses, silver, and gold from Rome were exchanged with textiles, spices, and dyes from the east. Rome's extravagant spending was felt in the coinage deep in the eastern China. China now traded regularly with the Persians. Envoys were sent to the west, embassies were established, but Rome's interest in the east was not as fierce as it had for Persia. In 113 AD, Emperor Trajan conducted an expedition into the heart of the Persian Empire. He had now taken Babylon and Seleucia, and wanted to set up provinces of Babylonia and Assyria. His victories were fleeting though. He died shortly of brain damage, and there were revolts in Judea. A political revolution was underway in Persia. The Sassanians became the ruling dynasty of Persia in 220 AD. Administrative reforms were enforced, merchants were regulated, several towns were founded, and Persia prospered. And Rome? Rome was declining. Emperor Diocletian set out to fix the fall in tax revenue and solve the cost of defending the empire. Instead, he went to the coast of Croatia to plant cabbages. He wrote to his friend, Come and see the cabbages I have planted myself. One could never be tempted by the prospect of power ever again. The contemplation of expansion of Rome Empire to India had turned to growing the prize-winning cabbages. Emperor Constantine had entered the chat, the first Roman emperor to convert to Christianity. Constantine took up several military and administrative reforms. A new capital was built known as the New Rome, and it became to be known as Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul, Turkey. This was a connected world. Ideas and trade flourished. The network of road had shaped the modern world which we now see it as it is today.